results were announced at about 3 p.m. Central Time in the update deck we published at the same link as this webcast. During this call, we will discuss our business outlook and make forward-looking statements. These comments are based on our predictions and expectations as of today. Actual events or results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent filings with the SEC. During the question and answer portion of today's call, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Please use the raise hand button to join the question queue. But before we jump into Q&A, Elon has some opening remarks. Elon? Uh, thank you. So the, the Tesla team did an incredible job in 2023. Uh, we achieved uh, record production and deliveries of over 1.8 million vehicles uh, in line with our official guidance. Um, and in Q4, we we're producing vehicles at an annualized run rate of almost uh, 2 million cars a year. Uh, this was really a phenomenal achievement. Uh, looking at just the, the, the Fremont factory alone, we made 560,000 cars. Uh, this is a record. In fact, it's the highest output of automotive plant in North America. Um, and people are often surprised that the, the highest output uh, factory, car factory in North America is uh, in the, the San Francisco Bay Area. It's a little counterintuitive, perhaps. Um, and the, it, it's really had a, an incredibly positive impact on that entire area. Um, what would have been a rundown strip mall is the highest productivity car plant in 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 the in the Americas. Think about that. It, it was derelict when we when we got it, and now it's the most productive plant um, in in this in this entire part of the world. Um, and it's enriched the community in in so many different ways. Um, it's uh, it's really a gem. So um, I'm super proud of the people that work there. Model Y became the, the best-selling vehicle globally, uh, as predicted. Um, the best-selling vehicle of any kind, not just electric vehicles, uh, with over 1.2 million units delivered. The energy storage business uh, delivered nearly 15 gigawatt hours of batteries in 2023, compared to 6.5 gigawatt hours the year before. So um, tremendous year-over-year -year growth, triple digits. Um, and um, I think we'll continue to continue to see very strong growth uh, in in uh, storage, as as predicted. I I said for many years that the storage business would grow much faster than the car business, and it is doing that. Uh, free cash flow remains strong at 4.4 billion in 2023, in spite of uh, record spending on future projects. Uh, so we had record capex expenses as well as record R&D. Uh, this brings us to 2024. There's a lot to look forward to in 2024. Uh, Tesla is currently between two major growth waves. We're focused on making sure that our next growth wave, driven by next-gen vehicle, energy storage, full self-driving, and other projects, is executed as well as possible. Uh, for full self-driving, we've released version 12, which is a complete uh, architectural rewrite compared to prior versions. This is end-to-end uh, -end, uh, artificial intelligence. So another bit nets, basically photons in and controls out. And um, it, it, it really is uh, quite a profound difference. Um, this is currently just with employees and a, and a few customers, but we will be rolling out to um, all who, all, all those, all, all customers in, in the U.S. who request uh, full self-driving in the weeks to come. Uh, that's uh, over 400,000 vehicles in North America. So this is the first time AI is being used not just for object perception, but for path planning and vehicle controls. Um, we replaced 330,000 lines of C++ code with neural nets. Um, it's really quite remarkable. Um, it, sort of as, as a side note, I, I think Tesla is probably the, mo probably the most efficient company uh, in the world at, for AI inference. Out of necessity, we've we've actually had to be extremely good um, at getting the most out of hardware, because hardware three at this point is um, several years old. Um, so I don't. I, I think we're we're quite far ahead of any other company in the world um, in terms of um, AI inference efficiency, which is going to be a very important metric in the future and in, in many arenas. So, um, see the the new Model Three is now available globally. 
So we, we did an updated Model 3. Uh, while the car looks similar, a lot of work has gone into the vehicle to make it better in every way. Um, it is significantly quieter, more refined, better equipped, has longer range, and many other improvements. And I recommend uh, taking it for a test drive. If you have not driven a Model 3 in a long time, uh, you should really try the new one. So steady improvements. And we're very far along on our next generation low cost vehicle. Uh, this is an earnings call, not a product announcement. <laughs> so there'll no doubt be many questions that try to ask us about new product, uh, new products coming, but, but we reserve product announcements for product announcements, not earning calls. So, but, it, but we're very excited about this and this is really going to be profound, uh, not just in its design of, of the vehicle itself, but in the design of the manufacturing system. This is a revolutionary manufacturing system, significant, you know, far more advanced than any other manu automotive manufacturing system in the world, like by, by a significant margin. Um, several years ago, I said that the, the, the uh, perhaps the most important ca uh, competitive characteristic of Tesla in the future will be manufacturing technology. And you will really see that come to bear with our next gen vehicle. Uh, the first manufacturing location for this will be at our Gigafactory and headquarters in uh, Austin, Texas. And then we'll follow that up with other locations around the world. Probably our uh, the factory we'll build in Mexico will be second, and then we'll be looking to identify a third location, perhaps by the end of this year or early next, um, outside of North America. So, uh, in conclusion, we had a great year with record production, record deliveries, and a strong free cash flow uh, in spite of a very high interest rate environment. Um, and we are focused on exciting new projects that will, uh, I think, ultimately, um, if we execute on all these things, and it is very hard to do all these things, it's not a, not a sure thing, but I, I do see a path um, where, where Tesla could one day be uh, the most valuable company in the world. Um, I, I do want to emphasize that is not an easy path and a very difficult one, but it is now in the set of possible outcomes. And previously, I would not have thought it is in the set of possible outcomes. So, um, and uh, thank you again to all of our investors, our employees, and our suppliers for a strong year. And looking forward to a great 2024 and years to come. Thank you. Thank you. And our CFO, Ray Bapp, have some opening remarks as well. Thanks, Martin. Good afternoon, everyone. As Elon mentioned, we had a record year in terms of both production and deliveries for our auto business, as well as record deployments in our energy business. This was achieved despite 2023 being a challenging year in terms of higher interest rates and higher inflation. Big thanks to our customer for being with us through this challenging period. I would also like to thank the whole Tesla team for their resolve and dedication throughout. In terms of 2023 financials, we ended the year with over 96 billion of revenue and generated 4.4 billion of free cash flow to end the year with over 29 billion of cash and investments on hand. Our 2023 Gap net income was impacted by the recognition of one-time non-cash benefit of 5.9 billion from the release of valuation allowance on certain deficit tax assets. This was due to our recent history of sustained profitability and is similar to several other companies who have recently gone through a similar change in their accounting. Accordingly, starting with Q1, our book tax rate will now be more in line with other companies in the S&P 500. In our vehicle business, we continue to see improvements in our per unit cost, despite us being in the early phase of Cybertruck ramp. As a result, our auto gross margin improved sequentially. That said, predicting auto gross margins is extremely challenging since there are many moving parts to this equation, some of which are out of our control, like the change in tariffs or local incentives, to name a few. While the teams are focused on cost reductions, we are approaching the limits within our current platforms. On the demand front, as promised, we made investments in digital campaigns in 2023. We fully appreciate the importance of customer education as we are still in a customer acquisition phase. Our data suggests that around 90% of our vehicle buyers in 2023 never owned a Tesla before. We are being creative in figuring out ways to bring in new customers and educate them about the benefits of owning a Tesla versus gas-powered vehicles. The key among them being total cost of ownership. This concept is mostly overlooked for just the upfront cost. 
we will be rigorous in evaluating our campaigns, curating the content, and optimizing spend accordingly to support the overall demand. There are two additional things I would like to mention as it relates to the US market. First, for customers who qualify for the IRA buyer credit, we now offer that as a point of sale benefit for Model Y, which means an immediate reduction of 7,500 at the time of purchase to the end customer. Secondly, we continue to offer very attractive lease rates for Model 3 and Y using our partner leasing program. Note that the sales under this program are recognized as upfront revenue and reported within automotive sales. Our energy storage business had another record year with deployments more than doubling and revenues increasing by more than 50%. This business is poised to again surpass our auto business in terms of growth rate in 2024. This has been in the works for quite some time with us laying the foundation a few years back by building our mega factory in Lathrop. I would like to thank the whole Tesla Energy team for their efforts to make this a reality. Our services and other business also started contributing meaningfully to our results and our fleets as our fleet goes. As we expect the fleet-based revenues from supercharging, used cars, and services to continue to increase. For 2024, our focus is to continue growing our output, continuing our cost reduction efforts, and increasing investments in our future growth initiatives. Accordingly, we are currently expecting our capital expenditure for 2024 to be in excess of 10 billion. We believe this would be critical in helping us lay the foundation for the next phase of the growth. Once again, I would like to thank everybody at Tesla, our investors, and our suppliers for being with us in this journey. We can open it up to questions, Martin. Thank you. Uh, let's go through investor questions. Uh, question number one is from Michael. Uh, given uh, that you moved the start of the next generation compact vehicle production to Austin, has the timeline improved so that we might see the next generation platform vehicles in 2025? Uh, we, I, I mean, I want to certainly say, say things with uh, that should be taken with a grain of salt. Um, since I'm often optimistic, with, you know, I don't want to blow your minds, but I'm Often optimistic regarding time, um, but our current schedule says that we will start production um, towards the end of 2025, so sometime in the second half. Um, that's just what our current schedule says. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of new technology, like a tremendous amount of new revolutionary manufacturing technology here. Um, the reason um, I want to put the this, this new um, revolutionary manufacturing line uh, at Giga, Te Giga uh, Texas was because we really need the engineers uh, to be living on the line. This is not this is not sort of a off the shelf, you know, just just works type of thing. Um, and um, it's just a lot easier for Tesla engineering uh, to live on the line if it's in, in Austin versus uh, elsewhere. So. Um, but but Burke, we are currently expecting to start production second half of next year. Um, that 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 is that will be a challenging production ramp. Like as a, I can't emphasize, we'll, we'll be sleeping on the line practically. In fact, not practically, we will be. Um, uh, but I I am confident that once it is going, it will be head and shoulders above any other manufacturing technology that exists anywhere in the world. It's next level. So uh, it's always difficult to predict what that S curve of manufacturing looks like. So it always starts off real slow and then it grows exponentially. Um, so, uh, and, and predicting that intermediate S curve is, is difficult, but you know, I, uh, so I, I, I don't know, it's hard to say what the unit volume would be next year. We're not gonna make any predictions on that front, but it does seem quite likely that we will start production next year. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, from Michael again. Uh, what has been the barrier to ramping 4680 cells into mil multi-million uh, cells per week uh, rate? And when do you expect to get there? Yeah, first, I just want to allay any concerns regarding 4680 limiting the Cybertruck ramp because I've seen some people commenting about that. To date, 4680 production is ahead of the ramp uh, with actually weeks of finished cell inventory. And the goal is to keep it that way, not only for cyber, 
but for our, our future vehicle programs. And as Elon said, it is an S-curve here too. Like it's it's hard to, to predict these things, but the, I'm just describing our goals. Um, it, it's a hard problem. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, there are entire companies where all they do is make battery cells. That's like the, all they do. Indeed, okay. indeed. <laughs> we do a lot of other things. Um, and and we've got a lot of we've got a lot of you know um, breakthrough technologies um, that that take time to figure out with 46. It's not just that it's a 46 millimeter diameter by 80 millimeter coal cell. That that's just the diameter. That's just the dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a tremendous amount of new technology in the cell itself and manufacturing technology. And, yes, exactly. Um, and just regarding what the team was able to do in Q4. Uh, Texas successfully swapped line one from the Model Y design of the cell to the Cybertruck design of the cell, which was the 10% cell energy increase I've mentioned before. And as with any major new product introduction, the factory and engineering teams collaborated to ensure quality of the new design and the process changes as their first priority. And now our focus returns to cost and production ramp in Q1. Um, and uh, in terms of what we're doing, we're currently running one production line, one assembly line. Uh, using two assembly lines in addition for yield and rate improvement trials. And we have a fourth in commissioning and four more will be installed uh, starting in Q3 this year. So definitely this is a, a big year for ramping 46.8. But we also do want to emphasize that we can we also expect to ramp orders from our suppliers. Yep. So this is not about replacing our suppliers. It's about supplementing our suppliers. Yes. Um, so we um, are very appreciative of, uh, of our suppliers. Uh, you know, Panasonic obviously is our, our longest uh, supplier. They're an amazing company. Um, you know, we've, we, uh, we've got um, CATL, we've got uh, LG, uh, you know, and, and BYD. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Adam. Uh, should retail shareholders be concerned that Elon has stayed? Uh, should retail shareholders be concerned that Elon has stated that he is uncomfortable expanding AI and robotics at Tesla if he doesn't have 25% of voting? Yeah, I guess let me explain why what, what my my concern is here, which is that um, you know I, I, I see a path to creating um, an artificial intelligence and robotics juggernaut of truly immense uh, capability and power, um, and. My concern would be, I don't want to control it, but if I have so little influence uh, over the company at that stage that um, I could so, sort of be voted out by some sort of random shareholder advisory firm. Um, you know, we've had a lot of challenges with uh, institutional shareholder services, uh, ISS, I call them ISIS, um, <laughs> um, and Glass Lewis. Uh, you know, which, which there's a lot of activists that basically infiltrate those organizations and have, you know, strange ideas about what should be done. So, um, you know, so I want, I want to have an, enough to be influential. I, like if we could do a dual, dual class stock, that would be ideal. I'm not looking for additional economics. Um, I just want to be an effective steward of very powerful technology. Um, and, um, the reason I just sort of roughly picked approximately 25% was that that that's that's not so much that I can con control the company even if I go bonkers, um, and if I'm like mad, they, they can throw me out. But I, but it's enough that uh, I have a strong influence. That's what that's what I'm aiming for is a strong influence, but not control. Um, there's some way to achieve that. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what is your expectation for automotive gross margin X regulatory credits for the full year? Like I said in my opening remarks, we're focused on reducing the cost of our vehicles. This is very extensive and involved exercise where we, whereby we look at not just the component cost down to, but down to the packaging used to get the materials to the production floor. Each element of the cost is scrutinized to optimize further. A few pennies saved at the subcomponent level whether through engineering redesign or for many other things which I mentioned, leads to cost reduction. This is a constant exercise and we just have to chase down every penny possible. We have a strong team which is hyper-focused on this. However, this is a very difficult ex thing to predict uh, precisely because there are a lot- We don't know. It's, uh, we, we, we don't have a crystal ball. So it's, it's difficult for us to predict this with precision. 
if, if, if the if the interest rates come down quickly, I think margins will be good. And if they don't come down quickly, they won't be that good. Yeah. Uh, it's always important to remember that the vast majority of people are buying a car is about the monthly payment. Um, it's not that people don't want. It. We, we have tons of the, 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 we have lots of people who want to buy a car but simply cannot afford it. Um, and so and and that as that as interest rates drop and that monthly payment drops, then they're able to afford it and they buy the car. It's pretty straightforward. And there are no tricks around to get around this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, does the company anticipate 50% volume CAGR to be realized in either 2024 or 2025? If not, why not? <laughs> As we've said in our prior guidance, there will be periods where we won't be growing at the same rate as before. We are between two major growth waves. The first one began with the global expansion of Model 3 and Y. And we believe the next one will be initiated with the next generation platform. In 2024, our volume growth will be you know, lower, as we have said, because we're trying to focus the team on the launch of the next generation vehicle. All right, uh, thank you very much. The next question is from Michael. When will Tesla start uh, construction uh, on the Giga Nevada expansion and Giga Mexico? And when can we expect each of these to produce their first products, such as 4680 cells, semi, and the next-gen vehicles? Um, we have recently broken ground for the next phase of Giga Nevada uh, expansion to incorporate semi and other projects. Um, but as said earlier, as regarding Mexico, we want to first demonstrate success with the next-generation platform in Austin before we start construction. Therefore, we have started the long lead work to get the basics ready and plan to follow our recipe from the 3Y ramp yeah. with Shanghai, where we started with learnings from Fremont and ramped really quickly. Yeah, exactly. It's important to emphasize that, uh, I mean, Model 3 production was was three years of hell, honestly, before. Some of the really worst years of my life, frankly. Um, I have still have mental scar tissue from that from those three years, as do many. Uh, yeah. um, but then, and then Model Y was... Um, you know, somewhat of a variant on Model 3, so much a much easier situation. And then we were able to actually do an improved, slightly improved versions of, in some cases, some significantly improved versions of the Model Y uh, production line in Shanghai and Berlin. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that's the right, I think the, sense, the sensible way to go about things is, is um, kind of, you know, um, figure out <clears throat> the, core, the core technology of the manufacturing line and then replicated with improvements uh, uh, throughout the world. So. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question from Michael is, has there been any progress made with an FSD licensing agreement with another company? You know, I, I, I really think lots of car companies should be asking for FSD licenses, but, um, and we've had, we've had some tentative conversations, but I think they don't believe it's real quite yet. Um, I think that that will become obvious probably this year. Um, and I do want to emphasize that if, if I were CEO of another car company, I would definitely be calling Tesla and asking to license um, Tesla full self-driving technology. It's uh, definitely the smart move. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Siddharth. Um, what is the timeline for Optimus first production of a volume production line? And what are the barriers to getting there? Optimus obviously is a is a, a very new product, um, an, an extremely revolutionary product, um, and something that I think has the potential to you know, the potential to far exceed the value of, of everything else that Tesla combined. Um, and when you think of an economy, economy is productivity per capita times capita. But what if there's no limit to capita? There's no limit to the economy, um, and and the the technologies that we, the AI technologies we developed for the car, translate quite well to a humanoid robot, because the car is just a robot on four wheels. You know, Tesla is arguably already the biggest robot maker in the world. It's just a four-wheeled robot. So, Optimus is a 
you know, robot with a humanoid robot with arms and legs. Um, it's by far the most sophisticated humanoid robot that's being developed anywhere in the world. Um, I, I think we've got a, a good chance of shipping some number of Optimus units next year. Um, but like I said, this, this, this is a, a brand new product. A lot of uncertainty is when you have when there's a lot of uncertainty and you're uncharted territory, it's the, obviously impossible to make a precise prediction. Um, but we will be updating the public with progress on Optimus uh, you know, every few months. And you can see that the it's advancing very quickly. Um, I was just in the Optimus uh, lab actually uh, until late last night. I think it's like midnight or something. <laughs> and finally left the Optimus lab. Um, the team's doing amazing work. Um, you know, that's obviously a case where we want to make sure that uh, Optimus is is safe, especially at scale. Um, and that there's no, it, it should be impossible for any centralized control to upload um, malware <laughs> to a humanoid robot. Um, so we're, we're going to want to build in um, lo lo localized shot off that cannot be updated from the uh, from from a central server. Um, that that's the case where we really have to give extreme thought to safety. Um, but uh, like I said, I, I I do think it has the potential to be the most valuable most valuable product of any kind ever by far. Just to comment on the barrier, I think the barrier, and we've talked about this, is like getting it to actually do something useful. Like we can get it to walk around, we can get it to do things, but it's like that utility part. We can already do some useful things, but like you know, yeah, to making millions of these things, it's like utility. Got to get the utility up. Yeah, a, a smart robot that can do gen that's capable of doing generalized tasks is what it will be. Yeah. Um, and in, in terms of doing, you know, moderately specialized tasks, well, it can already do that. And it'll just get better through through the course of the year. As we improve the, the technology in the car, we improve the technology in Optimus at the same time. It runs the same uh, AI inference computer that's on the car. Same training tech technology. Um, I mean, we're really building the future. The, I mean, the, the Optimus lab uh, looks like the setup of Westworld. But admittedly, that was not a super utopian situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not the best reference. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the creators of Westworld, um, uh, John Nolan, uh, at least John Nolan, uh, friends, uh, old friends of mine actually, and uh, I, invited, I invited them to come see the lab. I think they'll come see it hopefully soon. Um, it's, it's it's pretty wild, it's, especially the, the sort of subsystem test stands where you've just got like one leg on a test stand just doing repetitive exercises and one arm on a test stand. Pretty wild. Um, yeah. We're not entering Westworld anytime soon. <laughs> right, right. Well, we, you know, we can't take safety very, very seriously. Well, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, from Nermin is, how many Cybertruck orders are in the queue and when do you anticipate to be able to fulfill existing orders? Um, first of all, I want to thank all of the Cybertruck resident holders for their patience. Um, the, res the reservation to order conversion rate so far has been very, very encouraging. Uh, if the trend continues, as it's very likely to be, um, we will soon sort out all the bills in 2024. Um, and also, you know, we have new orders come in after the launch. Um, the order numbers keep growing. So we're now all hands on deck, focused on ramping um, so we can, you know, fulfill all the demands in a reduced wait time. Yeah, it's important to emphasize that um, this is very much a production constrained situation, mm -hmm. not a demand constrained situation. Um, 
and we you know obviously we, we like we could dramatically raise the price but that that doesn't feel right to us to sort of get get you know gouge people for uh, you know for early, early delivery um so um but but really the demand is off the hook um as long as the as long as we the the, the price is affordable um i mean i i, I see us ultimately delivering on the order of a quarter million, something like a quarter million uh, cyber trucks a year uh, in, in North America, but maybe more, but give or take, you know, r roughly on that on that uh, time frame. And um, it's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's it sure is a, um, a head turner. It, you know, definitely is. Yeah. Anywhere you go, people look at you. Yeah. They give you a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, like finally the the future looks like the future. Yep. You know, it just it, it just a um, you know, for for the other trucks on the road there, which and there's some very good trucks on the road, but if you were to switch out the brand name, you wouldn't hardly know who which company made them, but you definitely would know the Cybertruck. Right. That's our best that's our best product ever. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is: Can we get Tesla energy volumes reported in the production and delivery release? Uh, yeah, we will strive to do so starting from this quarter. Um, and just a brief update from the business perspective, uh, Megabat continues to see strong demand signals globally, driving consistent growth trajectory through 24 and 25. We want to thank all of our partners who've put their trust in the Megapack team to execute on critical infrastructure around the world. And I would like to personally thank the Megapack engineering and production teams for their strong 2023 execution. Um, Lathrop continues to ramp through 2024 with the operation of a second final assembly line to double capacity from 20 to 40 gigawatt hours by the end of the year. Thank you. And the last investor question is from Siddharth. Uh, what are the pre preliminary results on the return on investment of your ads and education campaign? Given that uh, many people still lack awareness that Tesla average price is less than the average non-luxury car price of $45,000, will you expand educational ads? Um, as you all mentioned, the ultimate solution to increase EV adoption is really address the affordability issue. Um, but at the same time, we do aware uh, there's an awareness issue um, as well. So in Q4, we ran a series of um, digital campaigns, very targeted digital campaigns um, across different geos and different channel. Um, the target of these tests is really just to drive awareness um, and ultimately they measure the return of investment um, on those digital channels. Um, and, the messaging we're driving is really focused on our product um, and also um, try to address some of the uh, misconception of the EV, um, such as safety, affordability. Um, in one particular awareness campaign we run uh, in Texas, we reached the audience about 10 million um, unique viewers and um, um, generated close to half a million visits to our <clears throat> website. Um, a, a large number of these viewers are first time visitors to our site. Um, the traffic through these digital channels um, actually behaved very similar to those organic traffic come to our web website. Um, so going forward, we're just gonna uh, keep exploring um, different channels and doing our trials um, to get a better understanding of this the effectiveness of this digital campaign. Yeah, but I would also <clears throat> like to caution that we'll be very careful that we don't want to overspend on this side. We wanna make sure people are aware, but we'll that's where we'll keep tweaking our, method, our methodology about how and where we spend the money, because we understand the importance of increasing awareness, but at the same token, we don't want to spend a lot of money on just creating awareness. Yeah, I mean, there are some geographies where our market share is remarkably low, like Japan, for example. Um, now, we obviously need to make sure that we have supercharges in the right locations, and the, the service centers are there, and. Um, the, the product works well in Japan, but Japan is the third largest uh, car market in the world um, of any country. So, um, and uh, we should at least have a market share proportionate to, say, um, other non-Japanese car makers like Mercedes or BMW, which we do not currently have. So, I think that's the case. And I've talk, when I talk to friends of mine in Japan, they're like, they're, they're like, there is like quite a lack of awareness of Tesla. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's the case where we we definitely need to uh, increase awareness uh, in uh, countries and regions where uh, there, there is, uh, yeah, 
not, not that much awareness. Thank you. Let's go to analyst questions. Uh, the first question comes from Pierre Ferragou from New Street Research. Uh, Pierre, go ahead, please. Feel free to unmute. Uh, Pierre, can you hear us? Okay. Well, it's really tough to find the unmute button on uh, on Teams, guys. I'm sorry for being late. Um, the, so, yes, my question would be, uh, you know, on uh, like the cost reduction, you've talked about it already a lot. And if I look at it over the last like five, six quarters on average, um, the Cox per car has been coming down like more than 2% uh, sequentially on average. So that means you're like on a trajectory of Cox per car going down 10% a year. So that's probably like unheard of in the auto industry. I don't think any car manufacturer ever uh, achieved that. But that's very, very mundane and very, it's a good performance, but it's a very normal performance in a lot of other manufacturing industry like microelectronics or uh, consumer electronics. Um, and so I'd love to hear your thoughts about whether you consider yourself closer to the latter, to like a, a microelectronics business where um, you have this ability to actually always improve costs, you have more control on how things are pulled together into your files, and you see yourself sustainably taking costs down uh, with that kind of pace, um, or, or do you think like, your ability to, to, to take down costs is actually um, uh, going to, to become more like in line with the rest in the industry over time? Yeah, I think I've covered this in a pretty lengthy detail, even in my opening remarks and in the previous question. But to just further clarify, we are constantly looking for what we can do to reduce costs. And like I said, it's a game of pennies. We've talked about it before as well. And the team is constantly going and checking where can we reduce the cost further. And do I believe that we will have the same pace which you've seen over the past few years. Probably not because remember we were coming out with a period wherein commodity prices were rising. So then we did see benefits coming from that. So th those are more or less, you know, taken care of, but there is more which we're still chasing. And, you know, I would say a big kudos goes to the team out here at Tesla, both the engineering team as well as the supply chain team. Because every time we give them a challenge, they go they go gangbusters to try and figure out whatever they can to take out for the cost. But yes, I would like I said, I would want to caution that do not project the previous cost reject reduction at the same pace completely in the future. Because with our current platform, we are getting to a place wherein you know there is there are limitations. Yeah, the, the, the increased scale also sort of helps us there. As we introduce new products, we have the opportunity to go renegotiate existing suppliers for better pricing. We're looking at every penny, like Webov and, and Elon mentioned. Uh, just to give you an example, our inbound logistics cost has come down by 22% uh, year over year. And this is because of optimization on, on using returnable packaging as opposed to uh, you know cardboard, which is even better for the environment. Uh, optimizing trucking routes, negotiating better pricing with shipping companies, with trucking companies, uh, going with the uh, full truckloads, uh, and and just doing that sort of. The bigger we become, the 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 more we put thought into these things, and the more efficient we become as a result of it. So those those work streams are going to continue. And we are also getting into the <clears throat> the tiers of supply chain to see where, if there are opportunities. Yeah, getting into the you know the tier twos, tier three, tier four levels, and then negotiate those pricing as well to get more efficiency out of the system. And then on the design side, um, uh, we're, we're not static, right? Like, especially in areas where um, the technology is still improving rapidly. Power electronics is a great example. You know, we, we continue to bring um, improvements there that are like fundamentals sort of driven from the device up that 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 result in in cost reductions generation over generation. And, and they don't only go into the new vehicles, they come to the old vehicles as well. Um, so that that's closer to what you were talking about with like the microelectronics space. Some of that exists in the in the in the vehicle. Yeah, certainly our car is more 
computer than car in many ways, and there and has a lot of new tech over the last hundred years of automotive production that everyone trying to scrape pennies from. Oh, we have a crazy amount of computer now cars compared to anyone else. Yes, yeah. it's like orders of magnitude. And we get to ride that down, right? Maybe a thousand times more. I don't know. It's some nutty number. I mean, like if I just look at the main microcontroller that makes the motor go, for example, like when we when I think about what it costs when we stuck it in a roadster in 2006, oh, it costs now. I mean, it's like there's no sure. comparison. Yeah, yeah. You know, so we've definitely been riding that electronics cost wave. Yeah. And then even on the like non what you call traditional vehicle side, we do things that no other automakers do to bring costs down through breaking down, you know, the way structures are built and you know, the way we put our cars together. And, and I think that okay. mindset that we have is very much closer to the micro uh, processor or power electronics industry than, than the automotive industry. Thank you. Pierre, Pierre do you have a follow-up? Great. Yes, a quick one. Um, it's, uh, you know, you mentioned this like phase in which you are uh, between two, uh, two big uh, gross, uh, uh, gross barriers. I'd love to hear you about, you know, what what you consider the size of your addressable market with, with the portfolio you have today, like the, the three, the Y, the X, and the S. Um, what's your estimate of your addressable market? You're shipping like probably about like a two million unit run rate today. Um, and given the price points of these cars, um, what kind of market share on, of what you address with these cars do you think you've already achieved today? I don't know if we've, does anybody, I don't, I, I actually don't think we have a firm yeah, I mean, like, idea of this. Uh, it's hard to say exactly. Yeah, this, I won't say um, there's, I mean, one way to think about it is look at the automotive industry as well. You know, EVs still contribute a very small market share. So, yes, our goal is to try and take as much market share out of that pie. But, you know, do I have a specific number to give you? I don't think we we can say that with certainty. And it's a growing pie as well. Exactly. It's like it's nine percent today, but it could be twenty percent in a couple of years or in the future. Yeah. yeah. And certainly, like the way we've looked at it, and we've always said this, it's not about like how many EVs we sell, it's how many great cars you can sell, how many vehicles you can sell, and that market's you know, hundred million a year, and you know we're barely two percent of that. I st I still think there's ninety eight percent more to get. You know. yeah, I mean, it's worth noting that if you look at, say, the, the, the average selling price of the other top selling vehicles in the world, they are much lower priced than mm -hmm. a Model Y. Yeah. Um, so like a Toyota RAV4 or Corolla, Corolla um, Honda Civic, you know, that kind of thing, they're, they're much lower priced than ours. So people are really uh, stretching their, their wallets to, to um, be able to afford a Tesla. It's, it's quite a difficult thing for them to do. And um, remarkable that it's the best-selling car in unit volume, despite being much more expensive than other high-volume cars. Thank you. Let's go to the next analyst. Uh, the next question comes from Adam Jonas from Morgan Stanley. Hey, everybody. Um, so I, I can't wait to see the Optimus Lab. I'm sure everybody on this call feels the same way. Your last AI day, Elon, was September 2022. Can we expect a Tesla AI day this year? It seems seems like a lot's changed in that in that realm. And is, is this year the time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> we, we have found that when we do these AI days, some of our competitors literally look at what we do on a frame by frame basis. Uh, they do. And, and, <laughs> and then we find these things being copied. Same thing with battery day. Same thing with battery day. Yeah. Um, so we have to be a little cautious about uh, you know, revealing the exact recipe of the secret sauce. Um, but um, I think some kind of update would be good to do. Um, I'll talk it over with the team and um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll, we might do something later this year. Um, our main goal with the, these AI day things is recruiting. So, yes. and to, to sort of change the perception of Tesla as people think of Tesla as a car company when they should be thinking of Tesla as an AI robotics company. Mm -hmm. um, maybe as a, as a follow-up, Elon, I'd love your thoughts on the topic of China-based OEMs expanding into Western markets as that as the China market kind of gets saturated and there's a tremendous uh, growth in the supply. How much success should Tesla investors 
allow for this competition to achieve in Western markets? And can you envision a scenario where Tesla could could partner with a, a Chinese OEM, OEM to help accelerate sustainable transport in markets like Europe and the United States? Thanks. Uh, well, our observation is generally that the, uh, the Chinese car companies are the most competitive car companies in the world. Um, so I think they will have significant success uh, outside of China, uh, depending on what kind of tariffs or trade barriers are established. Uh, frankly, I think if, if, if they're not trade barriers established, they, they will pretty much demolish <laughs> most other car companies in the world. So they're, they're extremely good. Um, We don't see an obvious opportunity to partner. Um, you know, certainly we're we're happy to you know, except on the the, the uh, supercharger front, we're obviously happy to give uh, any electric car company access to our supercharger network. Um, we're also happy to license full self driving, um, perhaps license other technologies, and um, you know anything that, that could be helpful in advancing the sustainable energy revolution. Thank you. And the next question comes from Dan Levi from Barclays. Hi, good evening. Thank you for taking the, the questions. Um, first, uh, I'm wondering if you can uh, just walk through some of the gating factors required to unlock your uh, next gen platform. You talked about a number of cost initiatives back at the investor day a year ago, things in manufacturing and, uh, and powertrain. Maybe you can just Give us a sense of where these initiatives stand, and do you believe it? We know that that there's a number of new features and technologies in Cybertruck, things like 48 volt architecture, and really employing your 4680 batteries. To what extent do you think Cybertruck is really a proving ground for the next gen platform, and is really going to be a gating factor to unlocking uh, the cost reductions needed for the next gen platform? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think that anything on Cybertruck should be considered gating for the next gen platform. We're obviously doing a lot of manufacturing innovation, as Elon said, for a next generation vehicle. You know, when you do something at that scale, you have to prove it out. You don't just throw it on the line and just build it. So we're going through those validation phases um, for all of those new manufacturing technologies now. Um, sure, 48 volt was definitely something we wanted to carry forward. Um, you know, and it's something we hope the industry adopts as well. We're also open to partnering yeah, on, on that volt. if everyone wants I mean, to do that. Finally, man, the people that really know that what, this is like an inside baseball thing, but it, man, 48, it's so high time that the water industry moved from 12, the random number of 12 to 48. It's random number of 48. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> much less random. Slightly less random based on human uh, injury, but um, I mean, dramatically reduces the amount of copper. You need a vehicle and, um, you know, and also moving, moving to a sort of high, higher bandwidth communications, um, sort of Ethernet, le uh, you know, level communications versus CAN bus, uh, which is pretty, pretty slow, pretty slow. Um, so it's really just bringing cars to, you know, to the 21st century. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. So, so, so <laughs> like certainly like it's, not exactly, yeah. it's like it's normal for a laptop. You know? Yeah, C certainly bringing that like, you know, it, is is an evolution in our in our architectures of vehicles, but it's not gating by any means. The gating work is just to finish the design and manufacturing of the car, test them out, and get them get them going. Yeah, and then programs in execution mode, right? Yep. Right. So it's ta it's ta talking about like tooling lead time, uh, manufacturing factory lead time, lead yeah. time, factory lead time, and executing those programs. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of specialized mach machines that make the machine yep. for a next gen vehicle. So uh, these are not machines you can just order from anyone. Mm -hmm. They actually you have to design a machine that has never existed to build a car in a way that has never existed. Um, yeah, so you don't just have like a design validation phase, but you have an equipment design validation yeah. phase as well. It does make it very hard to copy us because you have to copy the machine that makes the machine that makes the machine. <laughs> so, Talk about tears. It's not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a you know exactly manufacturing exception. Um, so you know I do think it's a, it's quite a a powerful sustainable advantage because um, there just is no place to go to order the machines that make the ne our next gen car that don't exist. Great, thank you. As a as a follow up, um, your release does not mention 
Dojo. So if you could just provide us an update on where Dojo stands and at what point you expect Dojo to be a resource in improving FSD, or do you think that you, you now have sufficient supply of NVIDIA uh, GPUs needed for the training of the system? I mean, the, the AI hardware question is, that, that is a deep one. Um, so we're obviously hedging our bets here with uh, significant orders of NVIDIA uh, GPUs, or GPU is the wrong word, there really needs to be, there's no, gra it doesn't, it doesn't, you can't like produce graphics. <laughs> so that's what, it's not a graphic processing unit, neural, neural net processing unit or something like that. And, uh, um, yeah, GPU is a funny, funny word, like um, vestigial. Um, so, um, and, and a lot of our progress in self-driving is training limited. Um, something that's important with with training, it's much like a human. The the more effort you put into training, the less effort you need in inference. So, just like a, a person, if you if you train in a subject, you know, sort of classic ten thousand hours. Uh, the, the less mental effort it takes to do something. If you, if you remember when you first started to drive, how much of, of your mental capacity it took to drive, it was, you had to be focused completely on driving. Then after you've been driving for many years, uh, it, it only takes a little bit of your mind to drive, and you can think about other things and still drive safely. Um, so the more training you do, the more efficient it is at the inference level. So we do need a lot of training. Um, and um, and we're, we're pursuing the dual path of NVIDIA and Dojo. Um, but I, I would you know, think of Dojo as a long shot. Um, it's a long shot worth taking because the payoff is potentially very high, uh, but it's not something that is uh, a high probability it's not like a sure thing at all. Um, it's a high risk, high payoff uh, program. Um, but, but Dojo is working and it is it is doing training jobs. So, and we're scaling it up. And we have plans for Dojo 1.5, Dojo 2, Dojo 3 and whatnot. So, you know, I think it's it's got potential, um, but I can't emphasize enough high risk, high payoff. So I think this, it still makes sense given the, you know, even, even if it's a low, low probability of success for the very high, yeah, I think anyway, <laughs> I'm belaboring the subject. It, it's, it's a very interesting program. It, ha, it, it's, you know, ha, it has the potential for, for something special. Um, there's also our inference hardware in the car. So we're, um, we're now on, um, what's called hardware four, but it's actually version two of the Tesla designed uh, AI inference chip. Um, and we're about to complete design of, it's a, the terminology is a bit confusing. <laughs> we're about to complete design of hardware five, which is actually version three of the Tesla design chip because the uh, version one was mobile, AI, version two was NVIDIA, and then version three was, was, was Tesla. So, uh, and, and we're making, Gigantic improvements, with um, from one from hardware three to four to five. Um, I mean, there's a potentially interesting play um, where, when cars are not in use in the future, that the in-car computer um, can do generalized uh, AI tasks can, can run a sort of, you know, GPT-4 or 3 or something like that. Um, you know, if you've got tens of millions of vehicles out there, uh, even in a robo-taxi scenario where they're in heavy use, maybe they're used 50 out of 168 hours, that still leaves, you know, well over 100 hours of time available of, of, of compute hours. It, like it's possible um, with the right architectural decisions that Tesla may in the future have more com compute than everyone else combined. Thank you.
And the next question comes from Colin Langham uh, from Wells Fargo. Oh, great. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, you know, as we're thinking about going into 2024, the, the press release talks about hitting 36,000 or slightly above in Q4. I mean, and the comments of the release talk about approaching the natural limits, and it sounds like you're continuing to try to whittle that away, but that sort of implies there's not much left. In addition, you have the hourly wage increase, I guess, so we'll add to that into next year. And I thought you said raw material costs are kind of that benefit is sort of almost played out. So is there an opportunity to, to continue to go below the 36 or should we kind of be modeling that it kind of stays at this level into 24? You know, we are definitely aware of the cost increases which are coming through because of the wage increases. But like I said, you know, we keep looking at other cost opportunities and try and figure out where else can we cut down. So there is definitely more opportunity to bring down costs further. I won't specifically guide to a number which we will try and get to, but there's definitely more opportunity there. Yeah, we're, we're chasing we're chasing lots of cost opportunities on the design side still for 2024. You know, um, north of eight figures is what we're you know, worth of and just in my organization and Lars has got a bunch. And then uh, from a commodities perspective, it's such a long Lovely. cycle time through the whole material supply chain that even with what we've already seen to this there's point, more to there's more to come on, on commodities reductions. And there's yeah. still some tail, tailwind left on the commodities. That's what I mean, yeah. And aluminum and steel. Yeah. yeah. And battery materials. It, 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 it boggles my mind to think that if we make a 1% improvement in costs, that's a billion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like, on average, if we reduce the cost by one penny, a billion dollars. What? <laughs> uh, you know, and we started off, you know, from that long ago that we we're only making like 10 cars a week. Um, and um, yeah. <laughs> so where does it lead ultimately? You know, with good execution, like I said, it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's not a slam dunk, but with, you know, if we execute very well, I think Tesla could be the most valuable company in the world. Thank you, Colin, do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, just a quick follow-up. In the commentary, you mentioned the taxes would go to the S&P 500 level. I think you've been trending slightly below 10%. S&P, I think it's typically 25%-ish. Is, is that gonna, should we expect that to jump right up next year when we're modeling next year? Uh, or it would be like a gradual change over the next few years and any cash impact from that tax change as well that we should be considering. Yeah, so there's no impact on cash taxes from a, from the release of the valuation amounts, which I spoke about. What it does is it's how you account for taxes on your book, on your books. So it's basically an accounting change wherein, you know, there are certain jurisdictions because we had enough NOLs, et cetera, wherein we didn't have to accrue book taxes. Now that the valuation allowance has been released and we have recognized different tax assets on the books, that means your tax rate immediately goes up. Okay. Uh, I think that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for all of your questions, and uh, we'll speak to you again in three months. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right, hey everybody, just uh, hang on here and we'll do some recapping. Just close that stream down and then I'm gonna turn the volume of my audio up a little bit slowly here just because I'm not sure if they'll match and hopefully we're at a pretty good level now. And we'll go back through the call and some of the takeaways uh, from, from the call. Just gonna make sure everyone can hear me. So if you can just let me know that that it's always a good check as we start off here. Audio good, sound is good. A little bit louder. Most people are saying good. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'm just gonna scroll back through. We can kind of start from the beginning, and we'll just go through the notes and. 
talk about you know some of the highlights, some of the things that are interesting. If you didn't catch it before, there is a link to the shareholder letter reaction uh, and the earnings report, sort of summarizing that and uh, thoughts on that. That link is in the description. All right, let's get into the opening comments. Uh, opening comments, I felt like we're, we're pretty well prepared. I think Elon spent a little bit of time, maybe a little bit more time than he has in recent calls on those opening comments. Uh, maybe that's just because it's a Q4 and kind of end of year uh, update but I thought those were well stated and sounded quite optimistic during that period of time, which was nice. So I liked the opening comments. Obviously, a lot of these things are going to be things that we already knew from the earnings deck that they're kind of just summarizing because sometimes not everybody reads the earnings deck and things like that, uh, but hopefully everybody is. So I'm just going to kind of go through and see. So next gen vehicle, they actually said quite a bit about that. So we'll spend some time on that. Right, FSD V12. So that was maybe the first, you know, big news. We've seen, I think, a couple of customers get V12 so far. Um, it sounds, it seems like Whole Mars has it and then maybe a few other people. Not 100% sure. But it looks like they're going to hopefully roll this out to all customers in the U.S. Or, uh, or in North America. It wasn't 100% clear on that. Over uh, 400,000 vehicles in the next few weeks. So hopefully we don't have too long of a wait before we're seeing this more broadly roll out. Obviously, the cadence is usually to test with a smaller group, and then presumably those tests will go well, maybe um, tweak a few things, and then start to expand it. So we'll look forward to that. As Elon emphasized, as we all know, this will be the first time they're using neural networks for planning purposes, uh, or for entirely for the planning purposes. Of course, they've been using it for the perception um, for a while now. So very exciting, and we'll keep an eye on V12. Um, Elon made a good point about just Tesla being very efficient with AI inference. A, a lot of, and Elon's talked about this before right now, a lot of it is just kind of throwing hardware at problems. And obviously that is very beneficial for NVIDIA right now. Um, but because Tesla has been constrained by the hardware that they've had in these vehicles, which at this point, I don't know, what are we, hardware 3 2019? Um, was it 2017 even? It's been a long time, so that hardware is, is very old, and Tesla's been able to get to where they are now on that older hardware through better leveraging software, right? And that should give them a lot of learnings for the future and hopefully make them more efficient when they do have hardware upgrades like we're seeing with Hardware 4. Uh, as Elon noted, that's version 2 of what Tesla has designed, and then version 3 of what Tesla designed with Hardware 5. Sounds like it's in the works, and maybe we see that actually implemented into vehicles a little bit sooner than we would have seen the change from hardware three to hardware four. So I think a lot to be excited about from that perspective and just a good point to bring up in general. Uh, as Elon noted, very important metric in the future in many areas, probably already an important metric today that is um, you know, under, under analyzed. Model three, I've talked plenty about that. Next generation vehicle, so he said they're quote unquote very far along. Um, very excited about the vehicle and manufacturing system, far more advanced manufacturing system than any other in the world by a significant margin. We've heard comments like that before, but again, a little bit later, shared a little bit more. Elon for many years has said that long-term Tesla's most sustainable competitive advantage would be manufacturing capability, which I think has always been a little bit strange to people. I think people have kind of always assumed it would be, you know, full self-driving technology or things like that. And I think there's good arguments for those things too and their value contribution and competitive contribution. But uh, it is interesting to see Elon continue to reiterate that and be excited about that element when they are obviously right now very deep in the production line plans for the next generation vehicle. So um, good to see that. Elon reiterating that he could see a path to Tesla one day being the most valuable company in the world. He didn't say Apple and Aramco combined this time, but... Um, of course, I think we would all be happy with an outcome like that as well. Um, CFO opening remarks. I don't think we heard anything too new here, uh, maybe except for this tax rate. So with the deferred tax now being recognized or released this quarter, which we talked about when the earnings report came out, it looks like the income tax rate is going to increase sharply here. So they mentioned from maybe 10% trailing 12 months or so to something like 25% could be a possibility. Um, I guess I can just look here quickly. I probably have my earnings report uh, stuff still up. So I'm just gonna check that. It'll take probably 
10 seconds here. All right, so income tax over the last, let's see, it's been about 200 million a quarter, so that's maybe going to double, um, you know, maybe a little bit more than double. So maybe we're looking at more like four or 500 million a quarter uh, for income taxes, for the provision for income taxes, if that's the case. So we'd be talking about a couple hundred million dollar impact. That happens below operating income and prior to net income is where that line item falls. So that would be something that would reduce bottom line earnings per share, but would not impact um, operating margins. So obviously it'll be interesting to see how people interpret that. As you said, there's no change to cash, but obviously sometimes people care a little bit more about how things are accounted for, which it shouldn't be that way, but uh, for simplicity's sake, sometimes it, it ends up being that way. So just wanted to quickly kind of explain what's going to happen with that, but we'll talk more about that, um, of course, next earnings around. Auto gross margin improving sequentially with cost of goods sold decline. Uh, they talked about this in the earnings deck in the outlook, se outlook section, I think. I think they mentioned it in the opening comments here. Uh, we got a few questions about it. Really what they're saying is, hey, we've made this progress. As we've talked about, some of the progress this year has been driven by a reduction in inflationary impacts that were present for the basis, you know, the prior year's basis, so or prior quarters. So with those things becoming more normalized, those opportunities for cost reductions diminish and then you have to rely on other areas for cost reductions, right? Which Drew mentioned a couple of them. From a design perspective, they're looking at, you know, eight figures, so tens of millions of dollars worth of cost reductions. Is that super significant? It's, it's not uh, on Tesla's cost basis. I mean, last quarter, I don't have this quarter updated yet, but I mean, last quarter total automotive cogs were $16 billion, right? So um, if I understood Drew, Drew co correctly, if you're talking and if I'm thinking about eight figures correctly, that's 10 million, right? So um, somewhere between you know 10 and 100 million dollars isn't too impactful on that. And he, he didn't say that that was exclusively the, the only cost savings that were out there. He was talking just about design. But in general, we shouldn't be expecting these quarterly cost reductions that we've been seeing to continue at least on the current generation of vehicles, right? Once they get the next generation vehicles going, then obviously that's going to change the the situation significantly, um, but for the time being, we just need to level set that, you know, this is kind of where things are with this platform uh, at this point in time. So, uh, Tesla said a few times. I've talked about it, you know, going back quite a while now that we're in between two periods of growth, and as I said earlier today, this is very normal in Tesla's history. There have been a lot of periods of time like this. You can go back to find years. I don't know, maybe twenty. 14 2015 or something like that where growth was like 20 percent, right so that's around where we were at this year for revenue if i recall correctly um it's it's not unprecedented and then next generation comes and the growth you know happens again so important to keep that in mind um and that's relevant for all parts of tesla's business automotive costs um, revenues everything deliveries um <laughs> they emphasize that they do fully appreciate the importance of customer acquisition. 90% of new customers this year, I think I got that number right, uh, had not owned a Tesla before. So, which makes sense as you're obviously growing, you're going to have more new customers. Um, it's, they later, I guess we'll wait till we talk about the other comments, but they did talk a little bit more about advertising too. Um, but they said they'll be thoughtful about customer acquisition strategies. Leasing, energy storage, or some other... Yeah, so all this stuff is pretty intuitive. CapEx in excess of $10 billion. I can't remember what the last 10Q said. I think it was maybe a range of 8 to 10, so that might actually be a small increase uh, in CapEx guidance, but I'd have to go back and double check on that, which we can do once we, well, we'll see it in the 10K. Um, so next-gen timeline based on moving to Texas, did that accelerate at all? Uh, interesting, that I think this was the top question. I didn't really expect an answer from Elon on this because... He talked about how this isn't, you know, a product call, and I, I think Tesla would be well served to try to keep this on the, you know, not that it can really be on the down low, but try to not talk too much about it until it's ready. Uh, but Elon did say that, although he's often optimistic, current schedule will start production towards the end of 2025. So we had the rewarders report, which we talked about earlier today, that I think it was June or July of 2025 was kind of the supplier indicated uh, rumor. 
So that seems to fit with what Elon is saying here. Uh, basically, he's saying the second half of, of 2025. So obviously, it's going to be a lot of work, a lot of new technology. We've seen with the Cybertruck, although there were extenuating circumstances, of course, there that can cause delays when anything like that happens. Uh, certainly with the Model 3 ramp up, there was a lot of you know new technology being used there. So, you know, keep expectations with that in mind. Um, but it is, it's exciting to hear them, you know, talking about it in, in more real terms with, with specific dates uh, and things like that. And although it still seems a little bit far away, I mean, that's, what is that, eight, 18 months from now? It's, it's really not too far off. So, um, you know, it's, I was going to say it's, it's not too long since we felt that way about Cybertruck. It's been about 18 months, you know, but <laughs> we were in that period of time with the Cybertruck for, for quite a long time now. Um, and, you know, now, now it's here and soon enough, the next generation vehicle platform will be as well. Um, explain about the decision in Austin. So I think we've talked about those things. Um, tough to predict the S curve. So that was kind of those comments on the next generation vehicle. Uh, for 4680s, I was, I was glad how Drew, or was happy to see how Drew addressed the, uh, the reporting on Cybertruck being constrained by 4680s, which was nonsense at the time, as we had talked about. Uh, so he said it's not currently limiting Cybertruck production. Obviously, there are many other things limiting Cybertruck production at the very beginning of this stage. Um, so there are weeks of inventory on hand of 4680s ready to go into the Cybertruck. Now, as Cybertruck ramps very quickly, that ramp could happen faster than 4680s, which then maybe you get into a supply constraint in a quarter, two quarters, or three quarters, whatever the case may be. Hopefully, they'll ramp in cohesion and 4680s won't be the delaying factor. Uh, but of course, you know, just something to monitor as we move forward, not at the current moment. Um, he always kind of reads through these 4680 updates quick, so I try to catch what I can, but he goes quick. So, Texas, they swapped one of the lines from Model Y design to Cybertruck's, um, you know, Cybercell 4680 design. He mentioned the 10% energy density, energy density improvement before, which had previously been mentioned as a target. So him saying that obviously, hopefully supports that they have accomplished that, which is good. Now their focus is on ramping production, lowering costs, of course, after this has sort of been validated. So um, it's a good spot to be in and hopefully one that they can progress from quickly. Um, currently running one production line, one assembly line. It sounds like they're adding two assembly lines uh, for rate and improvement purposes or working on rate and improvement with those new assembly lines. And then another installed later this year. So I think they'd be going from one to four, if I remember correctly, which I think matches what we had heard before. Some others have followed the 4680 line production um, specifically a little bit more closely. Um, 4680s in addition to other suppliers. Yeah. So uh, Elon talked about his compensation plan a little bit here, not really trying for economic incentives. Personally, I don't mind if there are economic incentives tied into this. I think it's, you know, that's probably a positive if, if there are. Um, I, I think if there is a similar, what, what I liked about the last compensation plan is it's at really lofty targets. If those targets weren't achieved, then there's no compensation, right? That's a very high risk incentive plan. And people complain about it that it was achieved, which is stupid because if it weren't, Elon would have gotten nothing in addition to what he already had. So I, I don't have a problem with that if these targets are, are lofty targets. And if you set those lofty targets, that says to the whole organization that the number one person in the organization, Elon Musk, the CEO, believes that those targets are achievable and is working to achieve those targets. That's pretty impactful for investors. That's impactful for employees, both current employees in terms of being motivated and believing that those things are possible and also for possible hiring purposes. Because people might sit here and say, I don't want to work for Tesla. It's a $700 billion company or maybe 600 now. Uh, <laughs> haven't looked. But um, maybe at that size, there's limited upside, right? But if you are sitting there and you see an Elon Musk compensation package that says that this could be a couple trillion dollar company or you know three or four trillion dollar company someday, that might change your perception a little bit about what the future potential is. And maybe investors think that already, but it's important to make those things clear to employees too, if that really is a belief that the company has. So, and if there's some economic incentive for that, like does Elon Musk need more money? I mean, you can debate about that. 
I think he's going to put that money to use. So it's, you know, it's more about capital allocation than it is about like, oh, this person can now buy more stuff. It's, it's really not that. So, I mean, we can talk more about that, but I think most people here probably understand what the situation would be. Um, so I don't have any problem if there is an economic incentive tied to that too. Now, obviously, Elon already has a strong economic incentive from his ownership in Tesla, and that would increase significantly in value if those goals were achieved anyway. Um, so there's a lot of things that would need to be discussed on how to structure it. But I think in general, there's a lot of reasons that it, something like that could make a lot of sense. And that's before we even talk about what Elon is really saying he wants it for, right? And that's, you know, control factor. So, um, which, you know, it's, it's obviously valid if you have the opinions that Elon has. His opinion on this also follows and makes sense with those other opinions. Um, uh, auto gross margin, X credit expectations. They didn't really say too much on that. Um, you know, CFO started in with kind of a long comment. Elon basically said, you know, we don't know. Um, a lot of, it'll depend on a lot of things. Obviously it'll depend on things Tesla can control and also things that Tesla can't control, um, you know, and anywhere along that spectrum. Um, Giga Nevada. So recently broke out in the next phase. So good to see that. I wish they would have shared a little bit more detail on that one specifically. Um, started the long lead items in Mexico, as they had previously said, but want to wait until the platform is proven out, then replicate that in Mexico. That probably suggests quite a long time from now for Mexico. So although we've seen a little bit of rumors, Samuel Garcia keeps talking about how that's going to happen soon. I think we just need to kind of set that on the back burner. It's going to be a while. It's going to be maybe 2026. You know, if you're starting production in 2025 and you really want to prove that out, you probably prove that out in, into 2026. Then you replicate the line. Maybe that takes into 2027. I know it feels like a long ways away, um, but that's potentially my interpretation of, of the comments today. So uh, just kind of keep that that in mind. And maybe that happens more quickly. Definitely could. Um, but if, if that's the process, like, hey, we prove out this production line that's starting in 2025, it's you know, that's going to take time and then you got to build the new one. So it just, all those things, if they happen in sequence, will take a while. Uh, FSD licensing, I think others should be asking. They've had some tentative conversations. We've heard that before. Elon has mentioned that, so that's not really anything new. Uh, but he doesn't think they believe it yet. Not surprising. <laughs> FSD at this point, it's, you know, it's Tesla's got to prove it out. Otherwise, people are just going to continue to write it off. It's It's been a long time with a lot of missed targets in terms of when Elon expected things to be achieved. So, you know, another year, no one's going to take it seriously until it starts happening. Um, hopefully, FSD V12 is a big step in, in that direction. And then as Tesla's training, you know, gets both more time for training and more resources for training, a combination of both of those, plus obviously a lot more data from an ever-growing fleet, Hopefully all these factors really start to materialize in, in terms of the progress and the rate of progress on FSD. And if that does happen in a way that is very apparent, right, it needs to be pretty clear that there's massive progress happening, then you start to see some sentiment change, conversations change, things like that. Um, I think that probably affects Optimus too, but Optimus timeline, um, I think Elon said good chance of shipping some number of units of Optimus sometime next year. Not going to hold him to that. You know, this is a, as you said, it's a revolutionary new product. Um, a lot of it is contingent on software capability. So just like FSD can sometimes be difficult to predict, that's going to translate to Optimus too. And hopefully we see good things with FSD. And, you know, if that stuff is good, then that also reflects well on Optimus um, at the same time. Uh, AI day, maybe at some point. Just mentioned competitive concerns with those. They've shared a lot because they're trying to appeal to, you know, engineers that love those engineering details and want to understand them. But to share, you know, to help them understand that, you have to help your competitors understand that. So it uh, kind of makes sense, their perspective on that. Um, I mean, I'm sure they've withheld things before, but uh, maybe just a little bit more reticent these days. Uh, Cybertrucks, I didn't, I didn't really catch what they said on the comments. Um, it sounded like they would convert orders into 2024, I mean, I don't know if they're trying to be optimistic from like a demand from a like a new order perspective to try to not discourage people from ordering. Um, I I guess I would kind of hope that they don't work through the whole, the whole backlog, which you know maybe a million plus orders, maybe a couple million orders. 
if they work through that in the first year, that's probably not a great sign for the conversion rate, although they did, they did say that they're happy with the conversion rate. So uh, the problem is that the first year of production, it's going to be lower, obviously, than the full volume production rate as they ramp, uh, probably significantly so. Once they do get there, though, 250000 a year, so maybe more, pretty much what Ilana said before. Uh, energy volumes, they'll start adding that with production and deliveries. I think that's a good thing. It does also, though, it's a little silly because of the volatility that I, I almost don't, I, I want to know that information, right? But adding it to a quarterly release, it, it just kind of like emphasizes the, you know, that this is an important number to watch each quarter. I don't really think that's necessarily true for energy because of the volatility of it. Like, do I feel like the energy business didn't do well in Q4 just because it dropped, you know, what, 15% quarter over quarter? No, not at all. Because I know it's just going to come back next quarter and they're ramping and things like that. But if you don't have that opinion, you open this earnings release with no context or, you know, this production and delivery release with no context and you see, oh, the Tesla energy storage fell, that business must not be doing well, right? So I get that the, you know, people want to see it. I get asking for it. I get Tesla providing it, but I, you know, it's one of those things that it's like you ask for it a bunch and then you get it and you're like, ah, did I really want this? <laughs> I don't know. Might as well just release it in earning, with earnings in my opinion, but um, that's, that's fine. It will be nice to have it for sure. Uh, okay, Lathrop, of course, ramping up. All right, what are the preliminary results of ads? So good question. Um, of course, they answer it saying ultimately it's an affordability issue, right? Which I kind of had to chuckle because later Elon said something about something else with Tesla being a perception issue. I think it was around AI day where they were using AI day to kind of change the perception around Tesla. It's like, well, there are other ways to change perception around Tesla too. <laughs> In other categories of the business, um, advertising obviously being what I'm alluding to there. But um, so I th I, it just that kind of struck me as funny. But anyway, emphasizing ultimately it's an affordability issue. It sounds like, you know, they're a little bit reluctantly doing this at this point based on their commentary. Obviously, it's good that they're doing it. I wish there was a little bit more enthusiasm for what could be accomplished here. I think Tesla right now is view viewing it as like, uh, man, this is not a first principles thing. This is, you know, ultimately, it's kind of stupid, right? Like marketing as a whole. And I was a marketing major, partially, like a couple majors. But one of my majors was marketing. <laughs> so I feel like I can trash talk it. It's all kind of stupid, right? It's really ultimately like you're paying money to influence someone's decision making or their perception or what they think about something um you know at best case it's like you're paying money to to tell someone that something exists that they didn't know about and and that kind of makes sense but if they know about it then really what you're paying to do is try to sort of to frame it not favorably like man manipulate their perception and you can have good intentions to do that but ultimately that's kind of what the goal is right like i want to change how somebody thinks about this and you can have really good reasons to do those things but that's i think that's kind of how like tesla views it as a first principles perspective is that's what marketing and, and advertising really is now that ignores all the good things about advertising of like okay if someone has the wrong perception should we really be mad about paying someone to help change the perception to something that is correct if that is the only way to do so in a reasonably quick period of time I don't know. I mean, we've talked plenty about this. and I, We don't need to get into a whole advertising conversation again, but it just, it seems like there's pretty obviously validity to that in certain circumstances and a circumstance that Tesla is probably in, in some ways, in some regions, as Elon commented on, there are certain markets where they feel like they're underpenetrated in terms of the market share and probably worth spending a little bit more time on awareness and things like that in those markets, which I think is you know, very logical, makes sense. Um, but maybe all of Tesla is like that, right? Like maybe the current levels of market share are, are all under where they should be. And there's not really a good way of knowing that until you start trying it. So I'm glad they're starting to try it, but I wish they were really trying it, you know? <laughs> and hopefully they are. And hopefully it's more of just like them trying to communicate their point of view to someone that maybe disagrees with them. So they're highlighting the things that are sort of pushed back on, on those types of things, if that kind of makes sense. Um, like they're taking the, the one side of the argument while still understanding the total argument. Hopefully that's the case. And I, I think that probably is the case. 
And I do think, you know, kind of starting slow, seeing what the return is, things like that all, all make sense as we have talked about before. But at the same time, I, I just hope that there is really a, a real effort to do it, to do it well, to do it as best they can. Like anything else, if they're going to do it, I want them to do it like Tesla would anything else, right? I want, I want them to do it well. So hopefully that's also their perspective on things uh, with ads. Not exactly my take on what their perception is from their comments on the call, but obviously, you know, those things can be misinterpreted. All right, we've talked plenty about that. Analyst questions. Pierre, I think, asked about COGS. We've talked about that. Um, I just, I don't think they were willing to share too much more other than, you know, they're kind of coming to the tail end of it. As I mentioned, after the earnings report, there are still things in there. Cybertruck, 4680s, those are negative impacts on COGS right now. And as they ramp up, they'll be less negative and hopefully in the future, positive impacts. And that can shift things for the total. How that relates to the overall scale of overall cost of goods sold, as I mentioned, you know, whatever, $16 billion, that's a, it's a big base. So how significant are those things in terms of con- contributions to the average? I'm not sure, but they are factors. So hopefully they are factors that are positive in the future. Drew mentioned things like design. They mentioned things like economies of scale, renegotiating with suppliers, normal normal cost control things that they're going to, they of course been doing, and of course are going to continue to do um, long term. And that, obviously, Tesla is phenomenal at those things. Um, total addressable market. <laughs> they were honest. They they said you know they don't don't really have a strong idea of what that would be. Um, I think the market's bigger than what's being sold right now, right? But I don't think that, like we've talked about before, I, I don't think that it moves the needle a whole ton. Like whether you're selling 2 million Model 3 and Model Y a year or 2.5 or 3 million, like obviously those are pretty big differences in terms of percent differences. But it, in terms of how Tesla is priced and the valuation and future cash flows and all of those sort of things, I don't know if that is all that material, right? Like I said before, it's FSD, next generation vehicle, Optimus. These are the things that are are more important um, to the future of Tesla and other things that will come, right? Elon has talked before about how things that we're aware of are not the exhaustive list of what Tesla is working on. So Model 3 and Model Y, it's kind of like, does anyone really care now about S and X? Um, A little bit but we care more about Model 3 and Model Y. And someday, Model 3 and Model Y will be in that category. Maybe not quite to the extreme in terms of the ratio, but you know, we, we'll look forward to when that is the case, I guess. Um, Optimus, um, yeah, so AI Day, we talked about Chinese OEMs. Elon, again, continues to give them credit. I think we've talked a lot about that and um, you know, certainly not surprised to see those comments. Um, yeah, kind of a lot of conversation around just next generation vehicle and gating factors and doesn't sound like there's anything like technologically gating is kind of my assessment of that conversation. It's more about they've got to build the manufacturing line, right? They need to um, design the equipment, test the equipment, build the equipment. You can't just go and buy it at a, a KUKA store. <laughs> you've got to, you know, design this equipment itself. So it takes time. Um, Dojo, I would say more bearish on, on Dojo. Uh, Elon is saying similar words here to what he has said before, like Dojo is kind of a long shot, um, high risk, high reward, but his tone was definitely, I think slanted a little bit more towards the, the risk side of it <laughs> than the potential side of it today. So and we've seen, of course, some turnover on the team. They do say that they've got Dojo training. So I don't know if it's a cost thing. I don't know if it's a performance thing um, in terms of how Tesla sees that falling in their own business comparing to, you know, an alternative from NVIDIA. But sounds like they're still working on it. It just, especially public facing when you're trying to recruit talent and things like that, I I think you probably lean more towards just being positive and it didn't sound like Elon's comments were quite quite that way. So uh, it definitely, you know, feels a little bit more like there's 
less, a little bit less optimism for Dojo than maybe I've heard on previous calls. And obviously that can fluctuate over time, but that's kind of just, you know, my assessment of how it sounded, you know, tonality wise today. Um, inference in the car. So we talked a bit about that hardware three to hardware four to hardware five. And Elon's talked about hardware five before, which I was a little bit surprised by, but it, it does seem like they're kind of going to that next iteration pretty soon. Um, and clearly they have in mind like what what these things can be used for when the vehicle is idle, because I'm sure they're sitting there right now and they're looking at this and they're like, man, we have all these hardware three cars out there that are just sitting there 95% of the time or whatever it is, something like that. Can we use that massive amount of compute for something? And with that old hardware, the answer is probably no or not much or not worth it. But when you're talking about your next generation design, even if you have a robo taxi that is only sitting idle, you know, 40% of the time, 50% of the time, whatever else, depends on the market, obviously. But if those vehicles are sitting idle there, and then what's, you know, what's going to be the situation where we can, or, or how can we design something that can then be used during those idle periods for any purpose, anything that can provide some extra value. And I think it's a great way of thinking about it. And I'm glad that Tesla is thinking about it. And I'm sure there are a lot of interesting ideas that people have out there about what, what it could be used for. I'm sure people that like Bitcoin would definitely advocate for something like that, but uh, it's, it's definitely interesting. Uh, costs, so we've talked about that. Income tax, we've talked about that, and that takes us to the end. All right, well, just checking the stock here. So I know we're down quite a bit. Um, as I said, I actually think the, the call was fine, right? Like, I, I think there was quite a bit of optimism and it felt like the whole team was very engaged. So I, th I think I was pretty happy with the call. <laughs> it's always hard to kind of differentiate between, you know, what, how, the stock, how did the stock react and how do I actually feel about it? I think I feel pretty, pretty good about it. I don't think there was any, I'm trying to think if there was any negative surprise here. You know, cost of goods sold, I know there was a lot of discussion around that, but they told us that in the earnings deck, so I don't think anything there should have been surprising. Um, I mean, next generation vehicle is matching the timeline that had been rumored. I guess the Mexico timeline's a little bit later, but I don't think that's going to be anything that really is pretty impactful at the moment. You know, some negativity around Dojo maybe. But again, it's like I don't think Dojo is really contributing to the stock price at the time at this moment, at least probably not very significantly. So yeah, I don't know if there was there were many negatives in there, maybe just a, a lack of more positives, like maybe people are just missing specific guidance for for this year, like we talked about before. Um, yeah, maybe just kind of the realization setting in of, you know, it's going to be a period of, as Tesla said, a period of time for Tesla between a couple of growth waves. I, I don't know why that wasn't the expectation before, if that's part of what's contributing here. I, I think it probably should have been, but um, that, you know, certainly people deciding, hey, I'm just going to come back in, in 18 months, right? Like there's certainly people that uh, could have that point of view. Now, maybe that's the right point of view. But sometimes the market has a way of surprising you. And that can be good or bad, <laughs> as many of us know. But there's a there's a possibility of it being good too. Um, I mean, I'm excited about FSD version 12. I'm excited about the training capacity that Tesla has and is bringing it online and the significant increase in training capacity that, that Tesla's gonna have here and how that will hopefully impact. So you've got the significant increase in training capacity at the same time as you fundamentally rewrote the architecture to be able to take better advantage of that training capacity, which even just the training capacity on its own would be a huge boost. And now you can actually leverage it even better than you could before. Those two things seem to go hand in hand extremely well. And maybe it takes time for that to come to fruition, but I just think it's an exciting combination. So, you know, does that mean I'd, I'd just want to like sit around, sit and wait around for 18 months for the next generation vehicle to start and like not own the stock during that period? I mean, not just my own personal opinion, but, but no. So meaning I, I don't want to change. I, I do want to <laughs> 
keep my position, you know, during that period, even if it is volatile. And I mean, that's always been my perspective, right? Like I've held Tesla forever. So, um, when you start trying to time and get in and out of things, it, I think there's, there's risk to that that sometimes isn't fully acknowledged. Um, all right. So, uh, it's a little tough for me to see the super chats in this, but I do see a few of those. So thank you. Thank you for those. I'll try to look here if there's questions. Um, I don't think I can add them on screen. Uh, feeding value back to the owner on the hardware is important. If Elon starts mining Bitcoin on my car with my power bill, I'm turning the car off every time I park it. Yeah, so I would assume obviously Tesla's not gonna like start stealing your electricity, right? Like everyone would just turn it off and no one would like that. So that I don't anticipate a scenario like that. More likely it would be Tesla offering a capability um, and letting the owner benefit from it, right? Just exactly like a virtual power plant would with a power wall. Like yes, Tesla gets probably some benefit from operating the virtual power plant, as does the actual person with the power wall uh, that has the hardware. It's a, it's mutually beneficial, and that's what Tesla is going to look for. They're not going to look for something that is extracting value from the customer at their cost. <laughs> it's just not not a good business model, and would be very short lived. So uh, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, let's see. Uh, a lot of folks who want a cleaner car are under the impression Teslas are poorly made. Fix that. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. I, I do agree that there's a lot of misinformation out there about that. For I don't know whatever reason, maybe just like early days manufacturing issues that have persisted in terms of perception. I don't know how you tell people like, hey, our cars are better made than you think they are. It's kind of a difficult one to to market around. I'm sure there's a solution, but uh, if you go out there and you say like, hey, we don't actually have panel gaps or something like that it just kind of like it it doesn't create that perception that you maybe would hope so that's a tricky one but yeah i mean obviously there are things you know other other facets that could also be uh, improved on in terms of the perception out there um okay i think i got to those super track questions let me see All right, John is saying Microsoft and Meta are estimated to be buying 150,000 H100 GPUs. Tesla has ample cash and a training bottleneck for FST progress, low expectations for Dojo, and only 10,000 H100 orders. Uh, why not buying more? I don't think that we know. Um, I don't think that we know specifically Tesla's entire order book with NVIDIA. Um, I'd have to go back because I think the H100, the 10,000 H100s, if I remember correctly, that's what Tesla had just ordered and taken delivery of, if, again, if I remember correctly and have turned on now. Uh, so that doesn't mean that that's their entire order book, right? Like I would assume that there are others. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if it would be to the level that Microsoft and, and Meta are using, obviously, but Tesla's looking at this. They're looking at what they have with Dojo. They're looking at what they might need in terms of training. They're looking at what they need to process from the fleet, how they can utilize that. Like this, this is all stuff that Tesla is really great at. I'm not worried about how Tesla chooses to, to spend their capital. They're going to do so extremely efficiently uh, and they're going to, I think, do so effectively as well. So um, yeah, this to me seems like right in Tesla's wheelhouse to, to manage, you know, perfectly. So I don't personally have too many concerns about, about that. And Tesla's got a, a big CapEx budget. They're clearly happy with, um, you know, dedicating a lot of that into artificial intelligence. Elon is very aware of what's happening in the space and obviously leading a big part of that. So uh, Eric, thank you. All right, uh, I think we're gonna wrap it up here, everybody. But again, make sure to check out the video of the earnings report if you missed that earlier. And thanks for joining for the earnings call. It's always fun to do these things with people and um, obviously now get a chance to reconnect a little bit after the, you know, the closing of actual daily episodes. But uh, nice to be back and, and talking with people. And obviously, as I said before, I'll continue that. Like I said before, though, I do need a bit of a break. So I'm not sure exactly when like the next episode will be from this point. Um, we're just going to 
it's going to be a little bit ad hoc, play it by ear. Um, I'm sure if there's major, major news, I'll hop on and give my thoughts at some point. But um, if not, certainly plan to do the next earnings call. I, I, I'm sure I'll probably have an episode before then, but um, just want to make sure people are aware that I would have plans to do that. If anything changes in that regard, definitely would let people know. Um, yeah, but it's been, it's been fun, fun doing this today, getting back into talking Tesla. All right. So that'll wrap it up for today. As always, thank you for listening. Uh, I guess make sure to subscribe. I actually lost a bunch of subscribers after that, which it's fine. No surprise, but <laughs> it's like I said, I'll still be here. Um, but that's okay. So I guess make sure to subscribe and uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, thank you.